Welcome back. This is Global Health and I'm Gail Fraser. This is going to be Unit 10 and we're talking about Global Health Ethics. So we're looking at the intersection between health ethics and human rights is global public health ethics. And we're going to look at case studies in Asia. So we're going to be looking at Hong Kong, People's Republic of China or Red China uh, and comparing it to Taiwan. But first I want to just discuss some of the publications and some of the researchers who are advocates for global public health ethics. So we have James Thomas who believes that the the responsibility of public health practitioners is looking at the fundamental causes of diseases and how to prevent them to achieve community health overall so again, universal opportunities for community health and to ensure the opportunity for input from the community so that you have a code of ethics and you're trying to meet the community's needs by actually asking the community what they might want. So this is James Thomas. We have a code of ethics that was published by Sandra Cadena. Again, she's looking at how to provide communities with information. So she feels like that is one of the most important roles of ethics for public health practitioners. We need to also get the consent of people before you uh, initiate uh, something, a health initiative. I think that she's very concerned about honoring and respecting the diverse values, cultures, and beliefs within any given community, and especially uh, in the diverse communities like you find in Colombia, and that we need to protect people's uh, information, keep it confidential, keep it private, that information about someone, say that they were treated for tuberculosis or if they're HIV positive, those things absolutely need to be held confidential. Or if someone has had psychiatric treatment, these are all things that our communities and our society, uh, there's stigma attached to it. So it's important to keep these confidential. So that's a part of our ethics, our code of ethics. Public health advocates need to empower community members. So our job is more to be an advocate for them to be resilient and be resourceful on their own. So that's part of our code of ethics because we can't be everywhere, obviously. So it's better to have people that know that they have the right to ask for certain things. The public health practitioners need to provide information, correct information, so that the rumors and different fear tactics that may be happening won't be followed. We need to also engage in collaboration, so working closely with the different people providing services to a community to build the public's trust. So you can think of some other things because I know that it's important to think about how you see things in your own neighborhoods. Ethical analysis, again, we've got Mark Roberts and Michael Reich. They've done some excellent publications. They actually wrote a, a guide to improving performance and equity for the World Bank. So they're well respected and they are from Harvard University. So ethical analysis of healthcare and distribution of essential medicines. So again, has a lot to do with ethics and the effective management of the distribution. So again, you have to be equitable in how you distribute things. And they have a book that they published in 2011 for the World Bank. A voice of practitioner, so again, this is a physician, and uh, she's Ruth um, Burnham. She says that it, ethics uh, should be focused on bioterrorism and infectious disease threats. So if she's focusing specifically on the impact of overall global threats. We need to be, as practitioners, we need to make a lot of 
uh, ethical choices and they have to be part of what we already have a foundation for. So she's saying that we all need to learn about ethics and actually follow them as we're making our decisions minute to minute. And we need to, one of the hardest decisions is allocating scarce resources. So we only have a very small amount of money. Who gets the treatment? Who gets the medicine? And again, there is no vaccine yet for Ebola, but who gets the, the special treatment and isolation and, and the supportive care to survive? from Ebola viral disease. So these are the types of decisions that people working in the field have to make minute to minute. Decision making, uh, Catherine Place is another person who's published and she feels like the bioethics in health is in crisis and that we are being pushed by politicians and others when in truth and in fact it's the public health practitioner who's best uh, placed to make these important decisions yet other ideas are coming into play that have been causing confusion and may violate the public's trust. She recommends that health practitioners be a new source of inspiration and that they provide strong input to public health e ethics. And then there's Timothy Holtz. He has linked back the code of ethics for public health to fundamental human rights. So that was one of the things that we mentioned in the very beginning of our sets of presentations. So equal remuneration for equal work, limitation of working hours and healthy working conditions. Now that is something that's enforced in many countries. I know it is in Colombia and it is in the United States, Canada, uh, UK, Netherlands, France, but a lot of countries they aren't enforced and people work longer hours and un in unhealthy conditions and they some workers are even locked in to their homes or to the workplace they live above the workshop and they're not allowed to leave. Recently, here I'm in Abu Dhabi, the, we had some of the technicians who work during the day who come out, laborers, and their dormitory caught fire. Well, it was locked. The men couldn't get out. And so they had a lot of deaths and it was attributed to someone falling asleep with cigarettes. But the fact that the door was locked and the people were not allowed out, that's something that in 2015 should not be happening. Nancy Cass also has, from Johns Hopkins, she did an ethical analysis and she thinks that uh, we have the hardest decisions as health practitioners when we're providing health services when it relates to safe water, immunizations, or essential elements of healthier lives. It's also when we are looking at minimizing threats. So how can a condition be averted? Meaning how can we avoid getting an infection? Or how can we avoid having heart disease or diabetes or some other condition? So it's something that's been prevented. So within her, uh, Nancy Cass's ethical framework, there's a six, six points that she includes, what are public health goals of a program, how effective is the program at achieving the goals, is it known or does it have p potential burdens on the program, can these burdens be minimized and, or are there alternative approaches, is the program implemented fairly, that means equitably, is everyone allowed to join it? And how can the benefits and burdens of the program be fairly balanced? Meaning the positive and negative aspects of any program, how are they balanced? So this is the way she would recommend that you evaluate a public health program. They have public health surveillance, so it's defined as ongoing systematic collection and analysis of health related information. It's essential for planning and implementation, and then, of course, revision as a feedback. So principles of healthcare surveillance, again, based on the, the principles 
So systematic collection, analysis, interpretation, evaluation, dissemination, and then it links back globally to public health. So again, this is one of the um, references in your library. Take a look at it. It's from Oxford University. So just to keep your attention, <laughs> uh, we've got our person jumping over the tennis net naked and so again we were going into the ethics it can be very tedious and long-winded but in truth and in fact it's something that's our heart values it's important for us to uh, keep in mind that a lot of things have been published about health ethic ethics and that is probably because there are so many blatant violations of those ethical concepts or humanitarian aid concepts where it has to be universally and equally available to everyone that we can't emphasize that enough but I just wanted to make sure I still had your attention so let us go on to talking about the case study uh, in China they have a lot of opportunity for um, questionable ethics because of the economic pressure on them to perform so they'll do that in part two. So this is global health and this is unit 10 part two. We're going into the case study of our three China, so Taiwan, Red China or People's Republic of China and Hong Kong. And of course uh, Hong Kong is now part of of Red China. They were merged, uh, what, five years ago. So they, but we, we still have their statistics separate because for health reasons, uh, Hong Kong is far better off being a former British colony than the rest of China. So let's take a look. So China is something that when you see a world map, it takes up such a huge area. And so it's clear far more than even Colombia, the diversity of people who live clear over here closer to Mongolia or in Tibet, and that's the, the controversial area whether Tibet is actually part of China or a separate country. So we have a lot of different people that, so Shanghai is very cosmopolitan, big, big, huge city, lots of tall buildings, uh, you know, comparable or even a much bigger city than than Bogota. Uh, Beijing is a more traditional city, more old-fashioned. Uh, they have buildings that are much older. Uh, they have a lot of uh, statues to um, historically famous Chinese leaders and so on. So it's, it's, a, it's the base of history. But you see, it's huge. Look, I mean, and of course Macau is uh, a separate colony that is uh, Portuguese and they have a lot of gambling. So you see there's there's a lot of diversity within China. And so what do you think of when you think of China? The Great Wall? As beautiful as it is, it's it's actually along the border, right? So that's only part of of China. You think of Tiananmen Square where they had the assassinations of the students who were uh, demonstrating. That's a very famous place in Beijing. Do you think of panda, the, the wild animals that are endangered that only eat bamboo? Uh, they're vegetarians primarily because <laughs> they move so slowly that they can't catch any other prey, but they, they'll eat a variety of things, but bamboo it doesn't move very fast, so it's a slow-moving, very big, uh, it looks a lot like a bear. Do you think of the cherry blossoms, do you think of uh, Chinese food? This is one of my favorite. This is uh, a steamed bun and it's called uh, bao and it, uh, it very often has either a bean paste or the, the barbecued uh, meat inside so it's very delicious. Or you think of the, the beautiful Chinese uh, architecture that they have in the, hidden, the Forbidden City in Beijing. So Chinese, China is the world's most populous country. So again, you, you think of China as being this enormous, you know, swaying masses. But in truth and in fact, you saw how big the country is. 
and because they have such immensely big cities, uh, then the lots of people live closer to the developed big city areas. So we're talking, you know, 20 million instead of the million or 7 million that are in uh, Bogota. In total, 1.3 billion people, so they have 20% of the entire world's population are Chinese. So it's not surprising you'll see Chinese everywhere um, in the world. Their primary industry is coal, so they do not have a lot of petroleum, although they do have coal. Iron, steel, uh, again, they develop a lot of textiles for apparel. They, of course, they're famous for their silk. They have agriculture and they feed their own population with rice, but they still have to import a lot of products, uh, wheat, potatoes, um, and of course uh, having a huge coastline, they eat a lot of fish, they, and they have a very fond of pork, so they have a lot of pig farms. China has four of the ten world's most polluted cities, so again, right along with everything else, uh, Nanking and Shanghai are on the top of the list when it comes to air quality is the worst because of the pollution, because of the congestion, because of the fact that they don't have environmental controls on their cars. Um, it's just an industry is not controlled. It's more like a developing country that's trying to promote industry without the environmental controls that more developed countries have. China again is very diverse, so you'll see families that uh, on the inner Mongolia that's part of China with that are walking with camels. You can see the, the very very sharp uh, mountains that you see closer to Tibet in the Himalayas. In there are areas of China that are very cold, and then there are areas that are almost tropical. So it's an immensely diverse location, China. The diversity of China it, it relates not just to its population, but it's also the politics of China. It still maintains strict control over its people as a communist nation. If a Chinese man and a Chinese woman are married, in Red China they are only allowed to have one child, yet the population is enormous. However, if, if, the, if the Chinese woman marries a foreign man, she can have as many children as she likes. So it's it's kind of, you'll see this mixtures of foreigners marrying Chinese women that will have bigger families. Political issues in Taiwan, once called nationalist China, remain unresolved because Red China would like to take over all of China. Well, they probably would like to take over much of Asia. China regaled, uh, regained Hong Kong in 1999, so it's actually been longer than I thought. So the Chinese rule over Tibet remains controversial and uh, fighting with Muslim separatists in some of the most western side of China is still happening. You know, So Tibet is controversial, uh, they have Hong Kong in 97 and Macau in 99 have been rejoined with Red China. In Beijing is the capital, so but it's not the biggest city, and it's not the most uh, industrialized city. So, like many uh, country capitals, it's not the biggest or the most productive, but it has the greatest number of museums and historic uh, value in Beijing. In 2011, the People's Republic of China unveiled their medical reform program, so universal medical service for everyone. And the country has, as we mentioned, 1.3 billion people, and that means that it's going to cost a lot of money. So they're saying that they may invest as much as 120 billion U.S. dollars to do it, improve primary health care. More than 1.2 billion people, including 10 million in Beijing, are only have the access to the most basic first aid kind of primary health care and public health services are very often farmers are trained with uh, maybe six months, three months even uh, training so it's not even uh, anything close to the, the excellent training that you're getting here 
at Unis Savannah and they're called a doctor and they really don't know what they're doing unfortunately so they wouldn't be a skilled provider even for delivering babies so the World Health Organization recently ranked China as the fourth worst out of 190 countries as far as uh, access to health care but consider the the diversity of China so here is one ethnic group of the the Hankahan and this group you see their the appearance of the people they are nearer Hong Kong and you can see they look very sophisticated they have very nice clothing um, that you, you see this military person hugging the baby that's coming in and uh, you, you see this man here he's my absolute favorite actor a uh, Chinese actor uh, Yao Ching Fat Hong Kong is part of China you can see it's enormously uh, developed a very very sophisticated uh, city with you can see all the high rises but then they also have an area where they're growing rice so Hong Kong is what most people think of when they think of China as far as how uh, sophisticated it can be and uh, it has a lot of development of the arts and the theater Hong Kong has a population of just over 7 million so it's about the same size as Bogota and it has its safeguards to health through health promotion. They have a very excellent health system there and the Department of Health is committed to uh, providing client-oriented or patient-oriented uh, services. The Cantonese, again, this is in the south of China, so you can see the culture is much different based on a completely different type of life environment. They tend to live on the river, it's very tropical and warm, in comparison to other parts of China and so this goes along with their community needs. I had uh, a mentor who helped me learn more about public health when I was a public health director for the country of Qatar. Her name is Sean Griffins. She's British but she actually has, she and her husband have lived in China for many many decades and she currently is the director for the Chinese University of Hong Kong School of Public Health and again she continues to try to improve the quality of healthcare providers and the the systems that they have in China in Hong Kong with an international master's degree in healthcare administration so you can see she is focusing on injury prevention, biometric, medical informatics, healthcare administration, but also epidemiology because you have to remember Hong Kong is very close to Guangdin, which is where a lot of the new types of influenza virus often spring from, and as well as public health and community family health. In contrast, Taipei, which is the capital of Taiwan, is again a very sophisticated city. Uh, it has about 2.6 million people and they have a very strong and wide-ranging uh, health services provided. Taiwan has its own Centers for Disease Control which is the lead public health agency there and again the, the inputs and the acceptance of Nationalist China or Taiwan of uh, Western eye medicine has been very uniform. They, that they have followed the guidelines produced by World Health Organization and the following Canada and the United States in much of the, the health service systems that they have for TB, HIV, dengue fever, all these different types of conditions. You can see that their center of disease control probably it looks much like what you'd see for any sophisticated system, much like the Ministry for Social Protection or Disease Control within uh, Columbia Ministry of Health. So you have all the different field offices, vaccination, all the different locations in Taipei, all the major cities within uh, Taiwan are included. So Taiwanese, again, 
we have diversity. The, they look different, they're culturally different and unique from people that live uh, in mainland China or within red China. So the many faces of China, the, you have the, the comparison now with our um, lists for Hong Kong, it was a former British colony, Taiwan is about almost 23 million people, whereas Red China has 1.3 billion. Of course, uh, Taiwan is very small, Hong Kong is tiny, but again, many of them are Buddhists and have a lot of cultural characteristics overall that are similar. But then the environmental uh, differences are dr tremendous. You can see within China that there's a lot of diversity in uh, life expectancy just from this map. And we compare Taiwan compared to different continents. So you can see Hong Kong here versus Taiwan and China. This is the amount of money that they spend per capita. So China spends far less than Hong Kong or uh, Taiwan. You can see life expectancy, Taiwan 76, life expectancy, Red China 71, Hong Kong is similar. You can see. All right then, this is Unit 10, Part 3, and we're going to be talking about humanitarian ethics in our global health class. I didn't uh, think we had quite enough time on this slide, so let's revisit it. One thing I was going to point out is that our um, literacy rate is very similar. Uh, again, our maternal mortality rates and so on, they're all very similar. But the main difference, of course, is that the mainland China or communist China, it's so huge that they have far fewer uh, doctors available per, per, per 10,000 persons. So let's talk about the melamine milk scandal. I know that it was a number of years ago, um, 2008 is when it hit the news. And I think that uh, in my heart, I just can't imagine how someone could purposely put a known toxic chemical in milk that is consumed by uh, children all over the world, in China, infant formula, Six babies were killed immediately from the infant formula they were drinking with melamine in it. 300,000 kids were sick. And so this is a huge scandal and they tried to kind of keep it quiet because that was when the China was hosting the Olympics that year. But once the Olympics were over, the news all came out. So what kind of impact did this have? I, I, you can imagine that we have milk, Chinese milk, and I'm afraid that what people in the world market do is they buy milk from the least expensive source. They figure, well, China, they have lower labor costs, so the product itself may be less expensive, but still of good quality. Well, in this particular case, this tainted milk that had melamine in it is was a, a crisis problem in 2008 and every single year subsequent to that has had stocks of milk with melamine in it and this what really gets me angry is that in 2013 so just two years ago seven years after the original incident that they still haven't resolved the, the problem with farmers putting toxic melamine in milk because it makes, when it's milk is evaluated, it looks like it has a certain amount of protein. So basically what they're probably doing is they're taking milk and diluting it, okay? They're putting water in it. In order for it to feel like it's actually whole milk when it goes to be tested and they sell the milk, they put melamine in it to make it appear that the protein content it, as it should be when it's actually diluted with chemicals in it. So that's scary. But what's even sadder is that milk bought on the world market, Chinese milk, is put in lots of products that we consume, like our Cadbury chocolate, our milk chocolate, from the United Kingdom, 
different products that come from Switzerland. They buy Chinese milk to make another product that we eat, the, the cookies and biscuits that we eat. So all of the products that had this tainted milk in it were also in other products that were sold all over the world. So when I was in Qatar and I was the director of public health, we had to pull it's like 68 different items off all the shelves in the grocery stores, every single one of them. So we're talking about a million plus uh, population, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of stores with Cadbury's chocolate, with different types of biscuits, things that had the contaminated milk in it. So it's not just a simple case where you've got 300,000 Chinese babies ill. We're talking about the world market and the fact that they purposely put, diluted the milk and put a chemical in it. So it really, this is a whole new range of questionable ethics and the things that it has a huge public health impact world, a global public health impact by having these contaminated food products being made available and sold on the open market. So China is no, it's not anything new for them to have food scandals. So here we have our glow-in-the-dark pork. And they said, oh, it's absolutely safe if you cook it thoroughly. But it had some kind of fluorescent bacteria on it. It was like, whoa, who knows what it was. I didn't have a picture of it in the article. They had lean meat powder, which was supposed to have pork in it. And this lean meat caused, uh, this powder caused heart palpitations, profuse sweating, and diarrhea. So again, it's a product that was made available and it was contaminated. Ah, okay, so another food scandal, take away food boxes. The actual foam box uh, was toxic. Uh, cadmium rice, it had heavy metal, which can be very, uh, make you sick right away. Bean sprouts with antibiotics and hormones in them. So again, they're trying to speed up and get more money for their product to, and they're doing it in unethical ways. Aluminum dumplings, so it, the, the, the actual dough that the dumplings were made with had too much baking powder that had heavy aluminum metal in it. So even mercury filings, all kinds of things turn up in Chinese food products. Tainted seafood from China. So again, when you think about China, and you think about seafood, when I, if, at least from the United States point of view, we worry about the Gulf oil spill. And the Gulf of Mexico had an enormous oil spill, catastrophic uh, environmental problem, and it's going to be decades before that water is clear again. So the shrimping and the seafood that comes from the Gulf of Mexico in the United States is not safe. 80% of our fish and shrimp that's consumed actually comes from overseas locations. So Australia, lots of places will have very good health standards, no problem, UK, um, you know, type parts of Europe. But the products that come from China, they have been banned by many countries, including the United States, because they historically have been contaminated with antibiotics, um, banned drugs and are unclean. So it's a real problem to the public health when these products are made available on the world market. Ah, just to keep you alert, don't you think that Michael Jackson, after he had all his different facial surgeries, look kind of Chinese? Well, maybe not. But I, I think that we have to really remember that Michael Jackson was um, a premier performer and uh, a, a wonderful musical artist and uh, it's a shame that he um, succumbed to some kind of drugs that uh, caused his heart attack and uh, so he's no longer with us. But again, it's just to keep your interest here. It was getting a little bit long on the Chinese seafood, but shrimps are off limits and that the, the, the United States has banned a lot of the fish and uh, shrimp products that come from China. So in summary, um, China is very diverse. 
People's Republic of China is a, a communist nation of 1.3 billion, so the B word instead of an M word, a people who have limited access to health care service. So again, the public health system has to come up to speed. I will encourage you to watch the video that has to do with the Red China's public health system. And again, it looks good on paper, but it's going to take an enormous, I mean millions and millions, uh, what was it, $120 million that they are planning to invest over the next, in a phased fashion over the next decade to improve the healthcare system because they just have so many people. Hong Kong invest in, and invest in their excellent health care system and public health services, as does Taiwan and Taipei. And it's, Taipei has similar quality to health care as um, if you were in Singapore or Japan. So, and those are the absolute highest in all of Asia, and questionably whether they're higher, the highest in the world. So let's look at our resources here. Again, we want to encourage you to look at evidence and information from these online resources when we're answering the class discussion questions. So Pan American Health Organization, World Health Organization, um, PubMed is another one. Um, this one I really like, the Public Library of Science. Again, these are fast track so that you'll get the most recent publications very quickly when you look at the PLOS site. Of course we've got the iLibrary uh, with the Organization for Cooperation and Development of e Economic Countries. And here's information about our China. So we see the diversity of China, the historic China, the fact that its uh, culture is basically uh, almost uniformly Buddhist, but there are other types of religions as well. The, the fact that it's very, parts of it are very cosmopolitan, but yet so traditional, I think is one of the things about China that's special. Ah, so just in case you wanted to see young men in front of uh, the statue in Harvard University, here they are, especially for you. And so when we had the, the scandal, as I mentioned, I was the director of public health in Qatar, and I think that the, the Chinese melamine scandal was just enormous. Uh, glow in the dark park and all these different things, you can laugh at it, but in truth and in fact, it impacted the whole world, as I mentioned, the fact that Chinese milk was incorporated in a lot of very uh, good quality products, not realizing that the milk itself was contaminated or tainted. And we have to explore the issues related to ethics and public health. When you look at uh, global food contamination, the surveillance that they have for it. As I said, just two years ago, in 2013, China has said that it has part, uh, a stronger surveillance system to monitor uh, food safety. I don't know. I just worry that uh, that it will go wrong again. So I'm hoping we're going to be able to discuss uh, solutions to reduce the risk of unethical contamination of foods from toxic materials. They knowingly put them in. It's not like by accident or it happened to have soil contamination or they're doing it on purpose. And then review the case studies for People's Republic of China, the Millimeter scandal, you just have to put in melamine scandal and Google it and you'll take a look. Even yesterday you could have found milk stock in China that has melamine in it. So I don't understand why that's possible because the dairy industry in Colombia is so important and it, it has such high standards. Uh, the cheese products, the milk products, all the, the dairy industry itself in, in Colombia is held to a very high standard. I think that a lot of people look at the, the farming techniques, agricultural and farming techniques that they have in Colombia and would like to learn many more things from it. They are like a model of success for the world, especially Latin America. 
because they've met a lot of challenges to be able to be successful in the dairy industry in a, in a world market that is very competitive. So comparing and contrasting the, the high public health standards in Colombia with China, I mean, there's no question <laughs> that the Colombia holds a very high ethical standard as well as quality. They have the types of safeguards and surveillance that you need to have in place to have a very good quality, safe product. And China does not. And I think that one of the things that worries me is that, okay, so they've set up a surveillance system and they've got a ministry of something or other that sort of makes sure that they check all these products. But what happens when it goes wrong and somebody gets bribed and things go wrong? Do you, I don't really want to have the head of this ministry that's supposed to be keeping the dairy products safe, you know, commit suicide or go to jail or be beheaded or these are the things that they do in China for these leaders that uh, have these huge scandals. I mean, this is what happens to them. Yet that doesn't protect me anymore just because he says he got blamed for the mistake. They don't really have the foundational ethics that are required to enforce what should be done correctly. So it's interesting controversy, and I'll be looking forward to reading some of your...